you through how that works. And uh, so what we'd like you to, to get out of this um, presentation is an understanding of the forces acting on an ice jam, uh, and then the ice jam force balance equation, um, and then certainly the re relationship between the internal jam stress and jam thickness, as well as the under ice uh, shear stress. Uh, we will look through look at a simplification of the uh, ice jam force balance equation uh, using an equilibrium ice jam. And then finally, um, we'll talk a little bit about the uh, force balance solution procedure. So I showed this image yesterday when we introduced ice jams, and so we'll revisit here again. But you know, what are the forces acting on an ice jam? And so let's let's be specific. What we're talking about again here is a wide river ice jam, um, and and so these uh, equations and assumptions go along with that. So with the driving external forces uh, with an ice jam promoting, you know, the forces that want to move it downstream, basically, uh, you have the gravitational force uh, due to the water slope, and then you have the shear stress of the water on the underside of the jam. And then you also uh, potentially have other environmental forces like the wind sh uh, shear stress on the surface. Um, now, the wind, that, that can obviously be quite variable depending on the direction of the wind, but uh, for discussion purposes, we'll, we'll assume that that's acting to um, to, to move the uh, the ice jam as a driving force. The resisting forces, uh, we have two principal ones that we consider, and that is the longitudinal shear stress and the ice cover, as well as the stress acting along the banks. And so this uh, diagram on the right uh, illustrates those, and, and is one we we talked about yesterday, and it just gives you a Kind of high level um, look at that and so that we can we can begin to understand what, what forces are actually occurring so here's the force balance equation uh not not too bad but we'll step through a few of the uh the variables just to make sure everybody's on the same page here so first of all we have uh capital b which is the uh the the width of um the channel there so they have the bank width you have F, which is the longitudinal force per unit width, um, and that's all equal to um, the sum of the uh, under ice shear stress plus the uh, weight component in the, the uh, longitudinal direction or downstream direction of the, the ice. And then you have to then remove the resisting forces. So in this case, we have the uh, tau bank as the uh, bank shear stress. And T in this case is the ice uh, accumulation thickness. So let's, let's break those down a little bit further. So tau G is, is uh, made up of the density of ice multiplied by um, the gravity force times the water surface slope times the ice thickness, okay? So that's essentially the, the weight of the ice that's promoting it to move downstream. So then you have uh, the fluid shear stress, and this is the, the tau sub i. And so that's the uh, density of water multiplied by the, the gravity force multiplied by uh, a term r sub i c, and we'll, we'll talk about that more in just a second, uh, multiplied by the friction slope, okay? So what is this r sub i c? Well, if you can recall just a, an hour or two ago when Chandler was talking, um, we, we talked a lot about the hydraulic radius when you put an ice cover on, right? So uh, R sub I is, is what we term that uh, hydraulic radius. And so the uh, R sub I C is essentially taking that ice affected hydraulic radius and uh, relating it back to the roughness of the ice as a ratio of uh, the roughness, the composite roughness. And so this, uh, ratio is then uh, raised to the one half power and multiplied by that hydraulic radius, uh, the ice affected hydraulic radius to get this R sub I C term. And that that is uh, included in what the uh, fluid shear stress uh, acting on the ice sham is. Oops. So now let's look at the resisting forces. So the tau sub bank, that's, um, Basically, the considered a, a function of a friction factor, uh, 
multiplied by the longitudinal force um, uh, of the, the jam. So this is a fairly uh, well-established sort of relationship with uh, granular materials. If we break down that force, that longitudinal force a little bit further, uh, what that can be set equal to is a coefficient, the, the k-jam multiplied by the uh, jam thickness t, okay? And so when we combine all these together, what we end up getting is, is the, the shear stress on, uh, from the bank uh, is equivalent to a friction factor, mu sub zero, uh, multiplied by the, the jam thickness. So now let's uh, substitute all these terms back into our original force balance equation. And so from the top, uh, what you see is, is substituting for the, the fluid shear stress, the gravity stress, and the bank shear stress. Um, and note that the, the uh, downstream forces or the forces that want to move the ice jam are, are acting across the entire width, uh, whereas the bank forces or the resistance forces, they only act on the thickness of the ice. So just uh, two things to, to kind of uh, note there. And what we end up with are two unknowns in this uh, equation, the second equation there. And you end up with the uh, long longitudinal force and then the jam thickness are, are the two unknowns in this situation. So why don't we start with a simplified example and hopefully that'll help kind of solidify what we're talking about here. Um, so if we start with what, this example, what we call an equilibrium ice jam. And, and so an equilibrium ice jam assumes uniform thickness along the direction of flow. And you can see that, uh, you know, in this illustration here, essentially you have uniform thickness. And, uh, you know, in reality, this is not, not how ice jams um, uh, are, are really shaped or, or this isn't really how, how they form. But it, what it does is it, it does provide us some insight into the force balance and it, and it simplifies it to an example that we can actually solve algebraically um, using the, that geometry. So in equilibrium, what we uh, assume is that the ice jam thickness are in longitudinal force are constant along the channel. So they're not changing as you move, uh, you know, from cross section to cross section. So if you set the the differential to zero, what you can, um, and then you also assume that uh, uniform flow exists. Essentially, you can set the uh, friction slope, water slope, and, and bottom slope are all the same. Uh, that allows us then to reduce this equation to something that um, can be solved with just a quadratic, and, and it provides a, a very straightforward solution to, to estimating ice thickness, okay? And um, what we normally see is that we see for, uh, you know, ice thickness will tend to increase for wider channels and steeper gradients, um, and it will decrease uh, with the strength of the uh, granular ice material uh, basically presented, uh, presented by that uh, friction factor mu sub zero. So you can just see that you have a, a proportional relationship with uh, slope and, and the bank width and then the uh, inverse relationship with that mu sub zero. So that <clears throat> while this is a simplified approach, um, you know, that, that we'll, we're, we're assuming equilibrium thickness under conditions of uniform flow it rarely happens in natural channels, as I, as I just mentioned a minute ago. And um, it, it does, however, provide some important insight into the relationship of the, the channel width, slope, and hydraulic radius, as well as the ice properties. So again, this equilibrium ice jam assumption is something that, that you can do, uh, you know, with pen, you know, literally a pen and paper. And it's, it's something that uh, just provides some insight into how the more complicated ice jam force balance is going to be solved. And so I think it's really helpful to step through these sort of uh, more simplified uh, problems, but, um, you know, definitely this wouldn't necessarily be representative of conditions we'd see out in 
So now let's look at the, the little more complicated problem. So what happens when the uh, longitudinal stress does vary uh, as well as the thickness as you move uh, you know, downstream? So let's uh, define first here, we have uh, this, uh, let's look at the, long, the average longitudinal shear stress in the uh, direction of flow. So then essentially we would have um, that multiplied by the ice thickness and then the bank width. And if we use set that to equal F, then we can then create a differential uh, that using our force balance equation with that uh, assumed um, that assumed shear stress. And the advantage of this is uh, basically we're going to relate longitudinal stress with vertical and transverse stresses, okay? So that's, that's where we're headed and that's why we're doing this. But uh, just this is a sub basically a substitution of variables that is important for everybody to understand as, as we move to the next slide here. Okay, there's a lot of information in this slide, so I'll step through it and um, uh, hopefully it, it makes sense, but we can certainly discuss it afterwards. Uh, first of all, if we look at the diagram on the left, um, so that's a, a theoretical uh, block of ice that is um, in the water there, and it has thickness T. Uh, what you'll notice is the force diagram off to the right of that block of ice that, that's represented in yellow there. So the vertical stress um, uh, in the buoyant ice is zero at the top and bottom, okay? And what happens is, is that the stress will increase linearly above and below the water surface. And you can see that with the force diagram there. Um, and so if you integrate uh, this force over that entire distance, you get a vertical, an average vertical shear stress, okay? So sigma z is, is represented as the average vertical shear stress. What we can do is, uh, as we move over to the, to the right side of the slide there, we see the equations. So the first one is the sigma z, the average vertical shear stress, um, or ver average vertical stress, excuse me. And what that uh, can be set as in terms of uh, ice and water density, as well as porosity. And so when you combine these terms, uh, we use gamma as, as uh, the, the variable representation there. And so you have gamma times T as that vertical stress, the average vertical stress. So now we uh, assume more Coulomb criteria for granular material. The vertical stress can actually be related to the longitudinal stress uh, using a coefficient of passive resistance. So this KP, okay. And so then uh, as, as we step down those equations, the next one is the, the gamma X, and that's the KP times the average vertical stress. And then as we move down further, we have the transverse stress, and that uh, can be related to the longitudinal stress in a similar way using the stress ratio K1. So you have uh, going back to the gamma T, which is our, our vertical stress, we now have K1, times Kp times the gamma T. So you essentially have two different coefficients relating the transverse stress back to the vertical stress. The bank shear, in, uh, this can be stated in terms of ice density and porosity. And so what we have are three coefficients that then relate it back to the uh, vertical stress, okay? And, and so we'll, uh, this is mostly just to set up the, uh, the, the next few slides, but I think it's important to understand how we're, we're taking these and relating the, the stresses in, in each of the directions. So let's go back to our force balance equation. So using the, the definition of force balance, we can now put it in terms of, of stress um, and substitute uh, the the uh, equations that we just were looking at, okay? And when we do this, we end up with a nonlinear differential uh, where we basically have the change in jam thickness by distance, so the dt dx is equal to this equation that, that is basically looking at the, uh, again, going back to the force balance, the sum of the uh, Shear stress of, of 
the water flow on the ice, the uh, gravity component of the ice wanting to move downstream, subtracting off the resisting forces of the bank. Okay, so we've substituted all those back in. And what we're terming this as is uh, in shorthand capital F. So if F is set to zero, uh, then thickness doesn't vary, vary as we go downstream. We simply revert back to the equilibrium jam force balance that we just stepped through, okay? So how do we get the, the coefficient of passive resistance, that case of P? Um, uh, well, what, what that is, is uh, essentially it's, we can put it in terms of internal, uh, the angle of internal friction. And uh, that's similar to like the angle of repose that, that maybe some of you, some of you are familiar with. Um, so the stress ratio case of one, um, that is often gonna be 0 0.33, okay? And then uh, again, case of zero, that's gonna be a function of the uh, angle of internal friction also, just a little simpler formulation there. So now that we have all those coefficients defined, we can then talk a little bit about how the force jam balance uh, solution procedure occurs, okay? So first, there's no analy analytical solution to this differential equation. So we, we must use a, a finite difference approximation. And the way that this uh, finite difference approximation occurs is, given an upstream ice thickness, um, we, and it basically can estimate an average um, to get the next downstream ice thickness uh, for a distance L, okay? And then uh, we estimate the, uh, the air associated with this. And so this is basically happening at, in conjunction with the step backwater equation. So we're getting stage and ice thickness as we, uh, at each step in the model. And so this uh, equation there, if you if you follow through, you basically can use an, an estimated average uh, change in ice thickness uh, over a certain length, add that to your upstream ice thickness, and that'll be your your downstream ice thickness. And so again, this is a lot like the the uh, step back water solution idea in hydraulics, where essentially you you estimate what the uh, friction slope is, and then you go back and, and make adjustments based on the, some sort of error criteria. So the ICM force balance is solved from upstream to downstream. And uh, as I just was mentioning, you assume some uh, some thickness at the next downstream section, and then you iterate. Um, one thing that is interesting on this is there's uh, at least uh, in most software, and I would say in HEC RAS specifically, there is a relaxation procedure that's used. So if you have a highly nonlinear um, change in thickness, which, which can exist in an ice jam, you, you may estimate a, a total change over a certain distance, but this relaxation procedure will actually only use a, a fraction of that, um, of that change. So you, you are able to handle highly nonlinear uh, problems by, by taking smaller uh, estimates as you move toward the solution. Uh, we also assume that ice cannot completely block the cross section. We touched on this briefly yesterday, but the, the main thing is, is that um, once a jam is grounded, then uh, these force balance equations uh, are, are going to be different. It's the uh, uh, the solution is not going to be uh, this this particular solution is not going to be applicable to a grounded jam necessarily. Um, and then. We will often specify a maximum flow velocity under the ice, and the default I believe is five feet per second. Uh, and then the minimum jam thickness is usually set to be uh, it's set by the user, but generally it's set to to be no less than the the ice thickness. So the global solution procedure um, again, the backwater calculations go downstream to upstream um, using the ice thickness, whereas the force balance is solved upstream to downstream. Um, and what happens is you, you uh, alternate solutions or you, you alternate back and forth until a solution is achieved. And, uh, and then the uh, uh, specification is generally through a, a, this global relaxation parameter where it's only allowed to change 25% uh, at each iteration. So uh, 
it's uh, it tries to to slowly move toward a converging solution so that um, if you hit any areas where you get large changes, um, with, it hopefully can handle those those nonlinearities a little easier. And so all this um, global solution procedure is referencing HEC RAS inputs, uh, but we, you know, assuming other uh, models probably have similar type of, of uh, inputs and information. The water surface elevation in any cross section is only allowed to change uh, less, uh, changes less uh, than 0, uh, 0 0.06 feet or some other tolerance. Um, and same, same idea with the uh, ice thickness. You can get uh, basically the convergence to uh, to occur, and then it will move to the next the next point. And so, usually, a total of fifty iterations for this is defined um, for convergence. And uh, but certainly more can be specified. It depends on what your uh, your uh, tolerance is, whether you're using the, the default uh, global solution convergence. So let's just do an example here real quick. Um, if you are looking at, um, you know, modeling a wide river jam, you would actually need to specify a few important things. First, the extent of the jam. So how far upstream and downstream that is, uh, the locations of that. The material properties of the jam. So you want to specify the internal friction angle, the jam porosity, um, case of one, which is usually set to 0 0.33, but you can change that. Um, the maximum flow velocity under the jam, uh, and then you also want to specify your roughness, or you can let RAS estimate that. Um, the the jam also needs to be uh, specified as whether it's confined to the channel or can include the overbanks. So that's a pretty important uh, assumption to to make when you're you're looking at modeling these ice jams. So what we hopefully hopefully you got through this uh, without <laughs> without being too glazed over, but essentially what we would like for you to remember is, um, you know, the ice jam force balance. Uh, it, it, it there are uh, several terms, but the the key ones are the uh, forces that are are driving the ice jam downstream in the direction of the flow, as well as the resisting forces, which are essentially the bank and the internal shear stress. Um, equilibrium jams are a simplified solution, so that's one way to, to maybe uh, look at this and wrap your head around it a little bit more. Um, and then by defining ice jam forces in terms of stresses, we can actually uh, figure out what that uh, the approximate uh, force is in each direction. And so this allows us to provide a uh, solution. A solution procedure for ice jams um, that will work within the um, standard set backwater type of model. And so that's currently how it's implemented in uh, HEC RAS. Um, so I'll end there and then ask if there's any questions. <laughs>